Welcome back, viewers. You're still here on Scope with me, Wilhar Rizmi. In this segment, we're going to discuss uh, threats towards um, the Muslim congresswoman in the United States, Ilhan Omar. A second Republican politician has now called for her to be hanged for treason. Now, originally, George Buck said that a staff member had mistakenly sent such an email, but then later backtracked and released a statement saying that he has actually stood by his comments. This came not not too long after Danielle Stella, another Republican, had also called for Omar to be hanged for treason, and this was done on Twitter. She's now being banned from Twitter, uh, and she had originally put up a picture as well of a stick figure hanging from the gallows as well. This is not the first time, certainly, that Congresswoman Omar has been threatened. She's been receiving a lot of threats, especially since Donald Trump called her out. Um, and of course, this goes to show essentially that the, the atmosphere within the United States, especially in a Trump presidency, has become that much more negative, especially towards uh, who is who are called the squad. So including the likes of representatives Omar and Rashida Tlaib and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and others, of course, who are also, of course, and have been receiving threats and have been at the receiving end of, of very negative tweets from the president also. Let's discuss all of that a bit further. We're joined now by Mariam Sarhan, who is a researcher of international studies and diplomacy at the University of London SOAS. She's joining us now from Washington, D.C. Also joining us from Washington, D.C. is Arsalan Eftakhar, who is a prominent human rights lawyer, founder of the MuslimGuy.com and senior research fellow for the Bridge Initiative at Georgetown University in D.C. Arsalan and Mariam, good morning to you both. Uh, Arsalan, let me start with you. What do you make of these threats towards Representative Omar? Well, uh, Bukhar, sadly, I'm not surprised uh, by these threats. I mean, in many ways, Islamophobia has now become normalized uh, within uh, the Republican Party and other right-wing circles in the United States today. And it started over a decade ago uh, with the election of a black man named Barack Hussein Obama. Uh, if you remember, during the time that Barack Obama was running for president, uh, there was a famous birther controversy where Donald Trump uh, had publicly stated that he wasn't even sure if uh, Barack was born in the United States and maybe he was a Muslim. Uh, and the fact that these whisper campaigns of Barack being some sort of crypto Muslim Manchurian candidate uh, were so pervasive that even today in the year 2019, uh, you know, nearly 30 percent of Republican voters still believe that Barack Obama is a Muslim today. And so being Muslim within the political sphere here in the United States has become a slur. And because of that, uh, Ilhan Omar, uh, in many ways, uh, you know, her, uh, the Islamophobia against her is racialized in uh, many different ways. It's rooted in anti-black blackness and anti woman and anti-Muslim rhetoric and, and anti-refugee and anti-immigrant, uh, you know, sentiment. And so there's a multi-layers there. And so uh, sadly, we, we've seen Islamophobia become normalized uh, within American politics today. And that's why we're seeing a lot of the attacks that we see today against Congresswoman uh, Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar. Right. So, so Mariam, what, what do you make of Islamophobia that's directed towards these women, um, especially, of course, Representatives Omar and Tlaib? Well, Lukar, I think, I think what we're seeing is all of uh, Congresswoman Alhan Omar's identities being attacked. She represents uh, an immigrant, she's a refugee, she's a Muslim, but she's also a Muslim woman who wears the hijab, which is a visible uh, symbol of her identity. And the, the vitriol that we've seen come out of you know, following her elect during her election, after her election, and now as she serves, really symbolizes the the darkest underbelly of American politics, where it's become unfiltered, and everyone um, has not kept in mind that not all speech is free is is free speech, and there are limits. And the you know, the Constitution and uh, the Supreme Court cases have illustrated that. And so my hope is that with time, people will change and that we just have to continue fighting back and hope that with we use the, the, spe the rights of freedom of speech that we have to counter the hate speech. Indeed. Um, Arsalan, you know, one of the disturbing, as you alluded to, of course, as well, is that this sort of Islamophobia and this sort of rhetoric, I mean, calling for somebody to be hanged for treason, that's taking it quite a step far, isn't it? I mean, where this sort of rhetoric is sort of just being accepted. I mean, I imagine, and I don't want to make a comparison to other groups of people because one, one would not want anyone to be targeted in this fashion. But if it was any other group, you would imagine that there would be a lot more uproar. 
Yeah, yeah, you're right, Wakar. I think, uh, you know, people have become emboldened within the Republican Party because of all of the Islamophobia coming from the commander in chief, uh, Donald Trump. Uh, you know, let's not forget that Donald Trump has a long history uh, of Islamophobia. He once famously told CNN uh, news anchor Anderson Cooper that, I, quote, I think Islam hates us. Uh, he's called for the surveillance of American mosques. Uh, again, he has, you know, alluded to President, uh, former President Obama being a Muslim. He has talked about, uh, you know, Muslims uh, being uh, enemies of the United States. And so, you know, when when the Commander in Chief and the leader of the Republican Party today uh, is saying such. Uh, unabashed uh, is Islamophobic statements, then you can probably imagine that other members of the Republican Party would then become emboldened uh, to say these sorts of things. Now, of course, uh, the Republican National Committee has uh, obviously disavowed, uh, you know, these uh, obnoxious uh, threats uh, against uh, Ilhan Omar's life. But again, it just goes to show that even though these are sort of fringe candidates. Uh, you know, at the, at the state and local levels uh, who are making these statements that, again, they feel emboldened uh, in ways because Islamophobia has become normalized. You're absolutely right that if they were talking about any other minority demographic group in America today, uh, they would rightfully be laughed out of any room. But the, again, because Islamophobia has become normalized, because anti-Muslim sentiment is accepted in mainstream America today, uh, you know, you don't, seem that same, you don't see that same sort of pushback. Uh, you know, against Islamophobia. And then, you know, Mariam, there, there is, the, if we talk politics for a moment, you know, uh, there is then the issue of, of course, these women and, and them talking about Palestine, for example, right? And what's happening in the occupied territories and that even Nancy Pelosi uh, didn't support um, any of their, uh, you know, speeches about that and any of their stances on that issue as well and being critical of Israel. Um, what do you make of that? I think that's the... The current political climate where it's very taboo to bring up the, the issue of Israel and um, how how it acts as a quote-unquote democratic state. Um, that, that, of course, I don't think has come to any surprise for anyone, as that's always been a very sensitive topic in American politics. But I hope that with time, we are able to have more open conversations that need to be said. And do you do you think in some ways, and Mariam, that, that these sorts of attacks on Ilhan Omar and even Rashida Tlaib at that time, of course, especially when that news at first came out, that this was sort of to be expected, um, where there would then be this this outpouring of negativity towards them for even daring to break that taboo? Absolutely. I, I think uh, both congresswomen knew that there would be, you know, some pushback, uh, criticism. They they. I believe that they're very intentional with how they uh, use the, the privileges that they have and uh, the, the power that people have entrusted with them to speak on their behalf. And I, I believe that they are they do have that in mind, indeed. Uh, Arsalan, what do you what do you make of that of these women speaking out about about Palestine? I mean, I, I think that's just one small layer uh, in this, you know, in, entire debate. And I think that a lot of this, uh, you know, rhetoric that we're seeing today uh, is coming because of the normalization of Islamophobia. I mean, there are there are there are a number of uh, members of Congress now who are starting to speak up uh, on the human rights issues related to the Palestinians. Uh, but again, I think that uh, you know, when you have the first two. Uh, American Muslim women elected to Congress. I mean, these these were hist historically elected women. Uh, you know, these were pioneers. They were firsts. Let me go to you, Mariam, with, with the next question about this issue, because if we're looking going forward then, and with Ilhan Omar having the kinds of threats against her life that she now has, uh, do you think the Democrat Party is actually willing to stand by her uh, continually? Nancy Pelosi has spoken about, you know, having further security, and I believe more security has been provided to the Congresswoman. But do you think that uh, the, the the party that she is part of is willing to stand by her to the end? Uh, I believe uh, you are indeed correct about uh, Majority Leader Pelosi uh, stepping up security to ensure um, Congresswoman Ilhan's safety. And unfortunately, it is a reality for many elected officials, but even more so for those who stand out, like Rep like Representative Omar and uh, Rashida Talib. So, 
I, I think it's an unfortunate reality that when you do become and when you are in the public eye, that you do face things like that. And it's absolutely horrendous and it's unfor- unforgivable. But it's, you know, in terms of the Democratic Party, I think that par- parts of the party are, are standing behind Omar. But I still believe that there's a, a good amount of people who don't want to talk about the controversial subjects. They want to stay clear of them. So we'll see with the next election how the tides will turn or if they'll mm. they'll be the same. If I may push you on that point, Arsalan, that you're making that, um, you know, about this mainly being about Islamophobia, because I, I would argue at some level that Arsalan, that, that they may have touched a nerve um, by talking about Palestine as openly as they did. I mean, do you not think at some level that things, the moment these two women broached that topic as openly as they did, that was essentially the the root cause and the outpouring of negativity that we saw from then on? Well, what I was saying, Wakar, is that the, uh, you know, Ilhan and Rashid are not the first two people to talk about the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Uh, You know, uh, in the neighboring district from Ilhan, uh, Cong- longtime Congresswoman Betty McCollum uh, has spoken out very uh, vocally uh, for Palestinians and Palestinian human rights uh, for decades. Again, what, I, what I'm getting at is because these were two pioneering American Muslim women who were elected into the halls of Congress, um, they had a political bullseye on their back. And so anything that they would say would then be amplified again because of their Muslimness. And in the case of Ihan, the case of her blackness in the case of her being a refugee in the case of wearing her hijab being a you know an immigrant uh, you know all these things uh, amplified these things and so i'm not saying that it's not a part of the equation at all but i think that it would be slightly disingenuous to say that that is exactly and the, the focal point again i think it is their muslimness i think it is their islamic identity that is central to the attacks that we're seeing here today and why we're not seeing a lot of pushback against that and then, Arsalan, I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm sure you may have seen this reporting by The Guardian, um, which just came out recently about an investigation that they've carried out about how a, a shadowy Israeli group has been encouraging and been carrying out a, a targeted campaign, a sustained campaign of far-right hate and lies um, uh, overall online, and especially through Facebook, right-wing groups on Facebook, but also targeting the likes of Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib. Uh, what do you make of such a sustained campaign against these women and uh, of Islamophobia. Yeah, I, I think it, it, it speaks to the, the era of fake news that we live in today. Uh, you know, obviously we saw, you know, the, the Russian disinformation campaign uh, here in the United States, but still continues until today. Uh, but again, I, I think that these, uh, these players are, again, they're capitalizing on this Islamophobia and then they know the fact that uh, you know, because of uh, past statements that, uh, that these congresswomen have made uh, on the Israeli-Palestinian issue uh, have been deemed controversial, have been amplified again because of their own identities. Uh, they're, they're, they're capitalizing on that, and that's why they're disseminating uh, this fake information, uh, you know, to over a million people on Facebook. Uh, and that's why it's essential that, uh, you know, Facebook needs to uh, monitor uh, and, 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 and ban, uh, you know, fake news altogether and, and not hide behind the guys uh, of free speech like Mark Zuckerberg has done in the past. Indeed, on, on that point then, Mariam, what, what are your thoughts about those Facebook groups uh, that are so right-wing and that spread malicious lies, really, about, be it representatives Omar or Taleb or even otherwise just Muslims in general in the United States? I mean, that, that feeds into this very negative atmosphere, doesn't it? It certainly does, and I think the we have guidelines that we're able to use from the Constitution, specifically the First Amendment and how it's been interpreted over the years here in here in American in the American courts, and you know whether it's hate speech, obscenity, certain certain areas that have limits. I think is what we need to go by because. Unfortunately, I think it's going to be very difficult to try to monitor speech that we may may not like. If it's in an area that is not protected speech, I think we'll be able to achieve that. But I think the reason Facebook has had success not being pushed in that direction is because it's well aware of that. 
All right, I'll get a final comment then from Arsalan before let's go. Arsalan, um, you know, one of the things that, that has spoken of very regularly when it comes to Muslims uh, in, uh, you know, influential positions in the U.S. is can they really be patriotic Americans? And as a Muslim yourself, uh, how do you answer that question? I think it's as ridiculous as asking, uh, can any group of people be patriotic Americans? I mean, uh, America is an immigrant uh, nation. We are a history of immigrants. Uh, Muslims have been here in the United States since its very founding, when you know uh, African Muslim slaves were brought over on uh, on slave ships over 400 years ago. Uh, many historians say that 20 to 30 percent of slaves brought over uh, were Muslims. So we have fought in every single war that the United States has fought in. Uh, we have served in the, in, the, in 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 Congress. We have uh, you know represented the United States in professional sports. Uh, we are 1% of the population, but we represent 10% of doctors, uh, according to some uh, studies. So again, we're as part and parcel of American society uh, as any other demographic group. And again, to, uh, to insinuate that Muslims uh, are not as patriotic uh, as other people is is rooted in Islamophobia. You know, it, 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 it again is, uh, it's part of that dual loyalty a uh, smear that Muslims and Jewish people and many other minority groups have faced here in the United States uh, since its inception. And so, again, we have to understand that, um, you know, when, when we're dealing with issues related to xenophobia, racism and politics, uh, again, there, there are double standards that come into play when you're dealing with people of minority backgrounds, both racially and religiously as well. Very well. We'll leave it there at that. But of course, we appreciate both Arsala and Mariam for their time this morning and, of course, for their insight. Uh, viewers, this, this question of how uh, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar is being treated, as well as Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib and the others as well, who are part of uh, what's called the squad, it's disturbing, isn't it? But especially with the Congresswoman now being threatened uh, with treason and to be hanged and et cetera, and that seemingly being accepted by the mainstream at some level, although there has been you know, muted condemnations of such calls by Republicans at some level, even the Democrat Party is seemingly OK with these sorts of threats, especially since these women also broached the topic of Israel, Palestine and what's been happening in the occupied territories and spoke about it fairly openly at that time as well. Then we've had Donald Trump, the commander in chief, who's also spoken very negatively about these congresswomen and has called for them to be removed from their respective positions, etc. Uh, all of that is very disturbing. And again, it goes back to, as Arsalan there said, the root of all this is Islamophobia, because the, the questioning of one's patriotism towards one country, uh, even as an immigrant, um, comes from Islamophobia because there's that, there's that perceived notion that a Muslim cannot be patriotic because they have dual loyalty somewhere else. We'll certainly keep a very close eye on this, but what, it is a disturbing trend certainly that is coming out of the United States. I'll leave it there for now though. I've been Rizvi. Thanks for watching.